you for joining us. On our special show today, we have the world famous actress, movie star, and best selling author, Suzanne Summers. In addition to being a very successful businesswoman, she's involved in many causes, including health and research in systemic rejuvenation. Suzanne Summers will introduce Bill Falloon, the co founder of Life Extension, following these messages. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like your attention, please. Thank you. We have the profound privilege and honor of welcoming here tonight our superstar. Ladies and gentlemen, big hand for Suzanne Summers. What a nice introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I might as well get up here. Um, thank you very much. That's very nice. Uh, this is incredible because there's a like-mindedness here that uh, brought us all together in one place at the same time. And I've been so passionate about um, anti-aging, but not from the perspective of how you look so much as keeping your insides young. It's all about being healthy. Anybody who's not been healthy, anybody who knows anybody who's not healthy, this is not what you want. And when we look, as Bill Falloon often says, at the present paradigm of aging, which is frail, decrepit, and eventually um, one of the big three, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and then the final resting spot of the nursing home, I don't know a person who thinks that that's a great way to end up. So how do we not end up there? And if along the way you can not end up there and live this incredible life we're all living with a brain that's firing and bones that are strong and uh, organs that are operating at optimum, that to me is real living. So we all are going to live longer than we've ever lived before, just the way it is. But, but what is the quality of that life? For the general public, the quality of that life is what I just described. Who wants that? If you're going to live a long life, you want life quality. That's why I've written so much about bioidentical hormones and putting back what we've lost in the aging process, and essentially filling the tank. And having done this for the last 20 or so years, um, I don't need a single pharmaceutical drug. I sleep eight hours a night. As you all probably know from my last book, I have a rockin' libido. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I have the time. The kids are out of the house. I've educated them. They're gone. Life is good. <laughs> um, you know, being alive while you're alive is what we're striving for. So that is, I believe, the thread that has brought us all here tonight. But I started this, um, I, I've written 26 books. I can't remember when I first met Bill Falloon. It was at least... 15, 20 years ago, something like that. I've been so profoundly impressed by him and life extension. Uh, they've taught me so much. The, the, one of the great things that life extension does for me with every single one of my books, before I turn it over to my publisher, um, after we go through the editing process, I give it to the scientific advisory board at life extension, and my whole message is, don't let me be stupid. You're all the doctors, you're the scientists, I gather the information, I have the passion. Do not let me get caught because if, if anything that I say in any of my books is challenged, um, I'm too easy to pick on. I played the dumbest woman in America on a show called Three's Company and so I gotta, I gotta be very careful of the information that I put out there and so far, out of 26 books, I've never been challenged even once. I've been ridiculed, but not challenged. <laughs> and that is as a result of what Life Extension has done for me. They have, they have done things that are incredible. You know, you all take melatonin at night to go to sleep. You wouldn't be taking melatonin if it wasn't for uh, Life Extension. They were the first to get that approval. DHEA, which is just a, an extraordinary anti-aging hormone that nobody even knew about before Life Extension. Um, CoQ10, you know, the drug companies that make statins hid in the drawer the information about CoQ10. 
the way I would describe it as a layperson is every, out of our 90 trillion cells, there's, there's discrepancy. Some people say 70 trillion cells, say, some say 90 trillion cells. Somewhere in there is what a human being is. Let's say 80 trillion cells. Every single one of those cells has a membrane around it that's made out of your essential fatty acids. In the center is the mitochondria. That's your energy center. But it's like a, um, a motorboat. If anyone ever had an outdoor boat, uh, you have to pull that ripcord, right? Well, the ripcord is CoQ10. But what the statin manufacturers found, and they, po they put it in the drawer, was they didn't want people to know that CoQ10 was missing from that. And that is where all that muscle wasting came from and, and lack of people who've been on statins for a long, long time who can't think. We've all been around people like that who just can't remember anything. So it was Life Extension that discovered the um, absolute profound benefits for energy of CoQ10. When you see an old person walking across the street, uh, what do you see? You see decrepit frail, right? They don't have any CoQ10 because otherwise they wouldn't be walking like that. So these are remarkable things. There's so much more. Cimetidine, he's trying to get me on metformin. <laughs> He's been trying. I don't take a single drug, so I keep fighting it. I know, I know, I know. I keep saying, but berberine does the same thing. Anyway, this is an ongoing discussion with Bill and I, but that's what I love about him because we can have this ongoing discussion. Bill Falloon is the founder and editor of Life Extension Magazine. Life Extension Magazine and the foundation, the Life Extension Foundation, is a gift to uh, all of us. And it is my pleasure to introduce Bill Falloon, who's going to make us even younger than we've ever been with a bunch of young blood. And who doesn't want a bunch of young blood? Not you girls. <laughs> Bill Falloon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for donating your valuable time to this humanitarian project that aims to save millions and millions of elderly people's lives. That is the purpose of this get-together tonight, to identify methods and then validate them to ascertain whether or not we can induce meaningful and systemic reversal of pathological aging processes. That is our enemy, aging. If nothing else kills us, aging will do it. And starting just a few years ago, the data started to come together. It meant that in the animal models we were seeing old animals being made young again in response to the infusion, the continuous circulation of young blood into old animals enabled the older animals to grow biologically younger. And this caused a number of people to start thinking, why don't we start doing that with people? And in addition to young plasma transfer, we've got a number of individual groups who are now self-experimenting. And we're getting incredible reports that will soon be published in which we are seeing meaningful reversal of pathological aging processes already. So we call this a biomedical renaissance. And the term renaissance has meanings that identify exactly with what we're seeking to accomplish. Rebirth, renewal, rejuvenation. This biomedical renaissance is the science of renewing elderly people. And frankly, most of you in this room fit into that category, including me. I'm 63 years of age. I could be collecting some Social Security if I wanted to. So we're officially elderly, and we need to be rejuvenated. Now, to put this into some context, back in 2015, the FDA approved the first clinical trial in history to see if a drug could reverse or just slow down aging in people. That drug is called metformin. And it happens to be approved, it happens to be approved to treat type two diabetes. Now a lot of people, they don't think they have any kind of diabetic issues. But if you're over the age of 25, guess what? You're developing some insulin resistance. You're slowly losing glycemic control. So there's some real benefit to healthy people taking metformin today. Front page of the Wall Street Journal, six months later, publishes an article about how older people are scrambling to get into this clinical trial to see if metformin can alleviate their chronic ailments and potentially enable them to live to be a healthy 
old age. Well, go back about 20 years. If you happen to be reading Life Extension magazine, you would have seen metformin as a listed anti-aging drug. We recommended metformin for healthy people in 1995. Now that's 20 years before the FDA approved a clinical trial to see if it even worked. And that has a lot to do with our topic tonight because if we allow those kind of delays, and these delays are massive, we're gonna die prematurely. And if you wonder why we were so enthusiastic about metformin, well, here's a study published in 1995. And it showed that diabetics who were on metformin, they had a 36% overall mortality risk reduction. Well, that's huge. If diabetics are dying at a 36% lower rate, why shouldn't we be taking metformin? Because it functions by multiple mechanisms to slow aging, reduce cancer risk, potentially reverse certain aging pathologies. Now you see that study, 1995, moved forward about 22 years, Journal of American Medical Association, it shows that pre-diabetics, and remember, we are all in that pre-diabetic state for the most part. Pre-diabetics on metformin, they delayed or reduced their risk of progressing to full-blown type 2 diabetes by 31 to 58 percent. So if you wonder why we're so passionate about metformin, it's because there are hundreds of studies that validate the anti-aging potential of this drug. I've personally been taking it for almost 20 years right now. We've got a number of people who have also been taking it for almost 20 years. They're not diabetic yet, and they're not diabetic for one reason, they're taking their metformin. And you talk about some of the scariest diseases out there, you come back with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, you know you've got six months to a year and a half to live. That's assuming you get some decent chemotherapy, which is not particularly pleasant. But wouldn't it be terrible if the doctor happened to mention after he diagnosed your pancreatic cancer that had you been taking metformin, perhaps your risk would have been reduced maybe by 62%. That's what the MD Anderson people found in diabetics who took metformin. They had a 62% reduced risk of pancreatic cancer. This is huge data. So if you wonder why we recommend metformin to virtually everybody, well, the data is rather compelling. But here's the problem, the delay. Metformin was actually discovered in the 1920s, and they sat on it. They sat on it until, in England, they approved it in 1957 to treat type 2 diabetes. But the FDA didn't approve it until 1994, a huge 37-year delay. But an even bigger delay is, here I am talking about the fact that people should be taking metformin, and it's 61 years after it was approved in England. Those delays are unacceptable. We can't wait that long for technology. So again, human age reversal, it's happening actually before our eyes as it relates to technology enabling people to live longer. Now this should have been a major headline because this data published just a couple years ago shows that there's a 56 percent reduction in death rates from coronary artery disease. That happens to be the number one cause of death in this country and technology has evolved to the point where 56 percent fewer people are dying. And there's some good reasons for that. We're living healthier, uh, there's better interventions, both conventional alternative medicine and healthier lifestyles have resulted in this huge 56% decline in the number one cause of death, and that was ignored by the media. Now, I wanna take a little bit of credit for that 56% reduction because we advocated for the use of low-dose aspirin to reduce heart attack risk back in 1983, so this is good data that we can relay about what we've done in the past. And the bottom line is, this is in the distant past. Life extension has been around 41 years. Uh, we cannot wait for age reversal technology. And here is a victim of delays in technology. Lyndon Johnson, I think all of you remember, maybe his, his speech where he announced he wasn't going to run for the re-election in 1968. And the main reason was coronary artery disease. We don't want to be a victim of those technology delays because you look at these individuals, these leaders of our country, famous people, they're only alive today 
because of medical technology that accelerated fast enough for them to get coronary bypass and stinting and taking medications and nutrients that enabled them to avoid what Lyndon Johnson had to suffer through. So this is how close we are to potentially controlling aging. And if we don't accelerate it, we're in bad shape because we're going to miss what I call the longevity boat. And that's why I started a brand new public benefit organization called the Society for the Rescue of Our Elders. That's us, by the way. We need to be rescued from the aging process. And our mission is to accelerate human age reversal research. And just for the record, we do not accept donations, investments. We don't have any type of bias. We're going to recommend what we feel works, and we're going to validate wherever we can which age reversal therapies are inducing systemic age reversal. So you're going to be given a choice at the end of tonight. Do you want to be part of the control group, which is easy. You do nothing, and you'll degenerate, and you'll die. It's that simple. <laughs> Now, if you want to be a little bit more aggressive, you can undergo some of the age reversal methodologies that we're advocating now, and we believe you can circumvent potentially every single one of those degenerative conditions. Because if we cannot induce systemic age reversal, we're really, really wasting our time. I mean, if we wipe out cancer, well, you're going to have a stroke or a heart attack several years later. At some point, something is going to do you in. Now, the biggest enemy is delay. We're going to propose tonight a program where we use young, healthy plasma in an attempt to rejuvenate older people. Now, if we succeed, we may not know which constituents of that young plasma is enabling those old people to grow younger. But again, if we succeed, what's the difference? We've already discovered a modality, just like Jenner did with cowpox, to prevent people from getting smallpox. We hope we can prevent people from aging further and possibly reverse it. So that's the analogy that I like to use. And the great news is we know far more about pathological aging today than what Edward Jenner did about smallpox. He did not even know the viruses existed, and yet he got rid of it. We know so many underlying mechanisms, and everyone in this room, I believe, is taking some steps to circumvent those underlying mechanisms of pathological aging. But we do have to do more. And the media is paying attention to the underlying science. The front cover of Town & Country talked about people potentially living forever. I know that's a shock, immortality, but it's making it into the mainstream, and they were running headlines like this. And for a lot of the interventions that we're, I'm going to talk about tonight, it does not cost a lot of money. But young plasma is not cheap. Young plasma costs lots and lots of money, so we need wealthy people in the beginning to self fund their own research or the research of somebody else to make this technology advance. Now, the tech titans of Silicon Valley, they are pouring money into aging research. These are the visionaries who saw how technology could revolutionize the world. These visionaries are going to try to cure every single disease through the unique methodologies that they develop to advance international technology. And Google, their founders, have been able to set up a company. The sole mission is to find a cure for death. They're young billionaires. They realize the only thing that's going to stop their party is aging and death. So they're putting money in with Ray Kurzweil heading it. They're seeking to find a way to eradicate aging. And Jeff Bezos putting money into the Mayo Clinic. Many other people are putting money into this study using synolytic drugs. That's an age reversal intervention that I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, but it has some real potential. CNN reporting on the fact that if you take a drug to remove the senescent cells in your body, you can potentially have a powerful rejuvenation effect. That drug is a leukemia drug, and it happens to have a side benefit, if you take it right way, of getting rid of your senescent cells. So good research is going on, but I can tell you even better news, we've already done a pilot study on dacetinib. Gates, he's putting money into Alzheimer's finally. He's finally looking at aging maybe as his own enemy, putting some money into that, and we're very happy with that. Craig Ventor, he's famous for helping to make 
the cure for aging a big business. We wish him all the luck in the world. I wish I could just go somewhere myself and pay some money and get my aging process taken care of, but I have to do this. I have to talk to other people who are just as interested as I am in making this happen. And the federal government, they're putting money into aging research. And it makes sense because Medicare is on the verge of insolvency. But guess what? We find a way to delay aging even five to 10 years, and we spare Medicare from insolvency, at least in the near term. So we've got a real good incentive. We've got the government, we've got the billionaires, we've got people like this in this room who are all focused on a common enemy, which is aging. And again, the media is picking up on what the scientists are finding. They're giving us some good coverage, and the Wall Street Journal, it did a study, or did an article, about a drug called rapamycin. Rapamycin, to define it simply, is a super metformin. It works much more directly in a specific way to potentially reverse aging. We are funding a study right now in Southern California where we're taking a group of elderly people doing baseline measures of, of aging biomarkers, uh, all kind of clinical measures to ascertain if rapamycin over a three to six month period can reverse aging in people the way it did in those dogs. And some progressive medical doctors are prescribing rapamycin. And within three to four months, we are gonna know if rapamycin can reverse aging in people as effectively as it does in every animal species it's been tested in. And people to Salk Institute, they were able to reverse aging in mice by manipulating just four genes. Just four genes, they were able to make these mice behave younger, look younger, and live longer. We're taking that technology and we're funding research right now to transform that into a clinical protocol as rapidly as possible. Now, when I say we, it's pretty much me. If a study <laughs> could be funded for under $100,000, I pretty much just write the check. I mean, if I have a way to live a lot longer and someone needs 60000 30000 80000 well, I just write the check. That's easy. It's a no-brainer. But these young plasma exchange studies, they're expensive. They require group participation. I can't do it alone. So this is one of the reasons we're together to talk about funding studies that go beyond rapamycin and dacitinib and metformin. We can do that already. Uh, the young plasma, we feel, offers a much greater potential. Now, most of us are aware that people are living longer, but if, unless we really look at a chart, we don't quite fully appreciate the fact that people are living a lot longer today compared to when we were born. Now, I highlighted on that chart the period of 1940 to 1960, because I was born in 1954. And I'll tell you, if I was like seven, eight years old and they were telling me your life expectancy is only 62, I would have been very perturbed. In fact, I probably was so perturbed, that's why I started Life Extension. <laughs> but, but, but nonetheless, um, if you look at the generation before that, 1900 to 1940, they only had a gradual increase of life expectancy to 55 years of age. Is there anyone in this room would accept 55 years? Uh, that's it? It's all over? Or 62 years? We don't accept it. Well, we're rebelling against the notion that 80 or 85 is enough time because we believe we can increase lifespan exponentially far beyond what you're seeing here. And bear in mind, it's, it's more than doubled since the founding of this country. In fact, 43% more people in the United States are living to age 100 compared to just year 2000. I mean, we talk about this renaissance, this biomedical renaissance. It's happening before our eyes, and we're just not fully aware of it. And if you wonder, well, how long can people really live? Well, a group of experts got together and had a paper published in Nature. That's a prestigious journal. And they determined there's no upper limit, no upper limit threshold as to how long people can theoretically live. They looked at the underlying mechanisms of aging. They said, well, if you circumvent these, then people will just simply stay alive. And this is an individual who could perhaps confer biological immortality. Dr. George Church, Harvard University, he is one of these CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing experts. He is pursuing research, and the good news is he's funded. He's gotten over $100 million of funding to perfect his gene editing technology, he believes, in the next five to 10 years. And we've had this validated independently by people who have looked at his research, trying to find, is this something that's not real? Can we poke holes in it? We can't. Within five to 10 years, 
we may no longer have to worry about biological aging. But I can tell you right now, looking at the people in this group, and it's a shame, that includes me, by the way, uh, a lot of us won't be here in five to 10 years. We need to intervene into the aging process. And I read obituaries to stay motivated, by the way. And uh, I mean, if you don't do that, you lose track of what's really happening. And John Young, astronaut, very, very vital, fit individual. I mean, he, he was more uh, fit and vital, physically uh, fit and vital when he was in his 70s than I've probably ever been. And yet he died of pneumonia. We've got to reverse immune senescence. And just another example, people with a lot of money. I mean, a son of the founder of Toyota, you've got all that money, and he died around the same time of pneumonia, immune senescence. I'm gonna go by these slides pretty quickly, but these are people who had a lot of money. They don't have any more because they're dead. And that's a little ridiculous. It is ridiculous when you have a lot of money and you don't target that money into research that could keep you and everyone you care for alive. And this is my all-time hero as it relates to billionaires who realized, wow, it's not fun to be dying when you have a lot of money. The money means nothing to you as a disease is slowly killing you. He indicated here, I have cancer. I'm making more money than I've ever made, but money does not mean anything to me anymore. And what we're up against? The inertia. People don't understand that we're in the very beginning phases of a method that's going to enable people to live a lot longer. And as a result, a lot of people are critical. And they're critical of pretty much every new technology. But that same slide is going to wind up including human age reversal as being an obligation of medicine. An obligation that when people turn 40, 50, 60, the doctors will say it's time to do an intervention. We need to keep you young. We can't let you get old. At this point, though, we need to reverse aging because delaying it only enables people to live longer. We need to fund research the proper way. So the technology that we are advocating for tonight is young plasma exchange because when young blood is circulated into old animals, well, the old animals grow younger. And this was published in Nature in 2015, essentially a review of all the published literature on parabiosis. That's the circulation of young blood into old animals. And all these studies came up with the same conclusion, that that young blood was enabling older animals to live longer. And that generated media attention. Washington Post said, well, you're doing this in the animals. Why aren't we testing this in people. We cannot wait for bureaucratic delays to advance this science. It's got to be advanced right now. Now, this is the next to the last slide that I'm going to show you, but it's the most terrifying one. I want to make it clear what this slide represents. I'm going to point to it. This box right here, it is a chart that shows parabiosis research in animal models. And that research peaked in 1972. They were doing study after study showing that young blood rejuvenated old animals, and then starting around 1972, the research fell off the cliff. And that is a huge risk. If we don't initiate the studies that we are advocating using young plasma concentrates, this could very well disappear for 10 or 20 years. We need to initiate these studies right now, or we risk something like this happening, where let's say 50 years from now, they start using young plasma and reversing aging, and they then show a recording of me talking in this room, saying, look at that group of people. They knew how to do it, but they just didn't want to push it forward. No one wanted to put, spend their money. They just didn't want to have this technology done, and here we're keeping young people uh, from growing old with a, an existing therapy. So I want to thank you all for coming.